I'm so pleased to introduce our panelists today. We have Hasmin Gusale up first. She is the co-founder and managing partner of I Think VC, which she will tell you more about. It is a early stage impact VC that focuses on capitalizing Paraguay, Uruguay, and Bolivia. We also have Luis Arbulu, co-founder and managing partner of Salkantai Ventures, which focuses on a wide variety of impact verticals in the Andean region of South America. We have Santiago Alvarez, the co-founder and managing partner of Alive Ventures, which is a slightly later stage impact VC with a climate and gender lens also focused on Latin America. And we have Sandra Sainz, the managing director of Sonin Capital, which is an impact wealth asset management platform operating all over the world, but with a particular fund focused on Latin America. So, so pleased to have this crew up here today. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Wonderful, and we are here today to talk about navigating exit opportunities in addition to navigating the exit environments that exist all over Latin America. As you all know, there are nascent emerging markets, more developed emerging markets within this region, and throughout, I think, probably all of our investment experience, we've encountered a lot of challenge, a lot of opportunity, um, and a lot of questions about the types of exit environments that exist in this space. So to get started, I would love to do kind of a lay of the land. It's probably not a secret to most people here that in 2021, there was a massive capital injection of a venture investment in Latin America. It was roughly 15 billion venture dollars came into Latin America in 2021. This was more than the previous six years combined. And since then, a lot of this capital has pulled back. There's been a, a bit of stagnation. So I wanted to start, um, Sandra, maybe with you about where this 2021 excitement came from and what's happened to it since 2021. Well, I think what you're just mentioning is it's a global situation. It's not just let them. So first of all, clarify that. Then where where the excitement has gone. I think that the, the I mean, the, the excitement is still there. But the thing is that now companies have a tougher time proving themselves before they get they get poor with capital as it was before, just uh, from very early stages. The companies need to now first check go to rent, prove that they have sustainable business models and that these sustainable business models are the basis of the valuations that they are presenting to the investors. So investors now are not more, not anymore just looking into huge uh, multiple potential, but they are actually looking into, into very in unit economics of the business models and seeing if these are really, really capable of achieving the growth that they are presenting to investors. And, and therefore, you know, giving return, the promised return to our LPs. So I would, I would summarize it in, in, a, in a very simple way. Now, I think that it is, it is come to, to the very basics of what really is the value of the companies. And in that regard, for all the sectors that we are here interested in, which are the impact sectors, meaning sustainable, company, well, companies that are fighting for sustainable causes or companies that are uh, fighting for social problems, there's a huge potential there because these problems are only growing, uh, as we all know, and there's an urgency, you know, as this, as this conference has been all about, about solving these, these issues. So the companies that have the, the, the drive to, and, the, and, the, and the way and an and innovation to, to, to really tackle these problems are really going to have the potential to grow and to show that promised return to LP. So I think that the, that the fundamentals for them are even stronger than many other companies that are maybe doing other things that are not so relevant anymore, right? For, for the world, for the investors, for everyone. So I would start saying that when we say impact investing, it, should, it is now a better time than ever to do it. I love that. And, and one of the things that you said in prep for this conversation that I really appreciated was how there's all sorts of exit activity happening in the region that maybe doesn't receive the same degree of noise as exit activity happening in other regions. Um, so there are several LPs that may not know about all of the opportunities that exist for your all portfolio companies to exit. Hasmin, how are you navigating 
LP expectations in terms of timeline of your portfolio to exit and what their exit prospects might eventually look like? Yeah. Okay, let me tell you a little bit more about <clears throat> I think VC. So we focus on emerging ecosystems in, within LATAM, within this emerging region uh, of ecosystem, we focus on five specific countries. There are Ecuador, Peru, Paraguay, Bolivia, Uruguay, and what else I think? I, uh, Peru, of course. And, and so in terms of LPs that want to invest in, in the Latin American countries and the Latin American ecosystem, there is a specific value of uh, getting into know these, these five ecosystems that are as we want to say, frontier ecosystem. So um, it's very important to understand the region as a whole and to understand that these specific five countries are emerging ecosystem that is very important to be there, there first to get the, ber the best seat. So in the next question, maybe I can tell you a little bit more about uh, what we do, how we think this, but uh, our ecosystem are still growing, but it's very important to be there at the beginning. So for example, I was reading yesterday that within all the ecosystems in, in Latin America, Chile and Colombia has been the ecosystem with the highest growth. So my question is, who are they going to be the next two or three ecosystems with this highest growth? And are going to be these five ecosystems that we are going to focus. So it's very important to look that Latin America is not one country, as United States is one country. There are so many ec ecosystems and there are so many countries going on there. And I know Colombia, for you, Santiago, is, is one of the regions that you focus specifically on, one of the countries you focus specifically on. What sorts of exit opportunities are you seeing in Colombia and in the other countries you focus on within a lives portfolio? Yes. Um, I, th I think that's a very good question, Savannah, because, I mean, for no one is a secret, sort of, that liquidity in Latin America is, is one of the biggest challenges, sort of, for, for, you know, the venture ecosystem. And it's, it actually, it's not even for venture. It's, it's for the, the entire alternative assets of private market, because, um, you know, even when you look at private equity outside Bra Brazil and Mexico, um, that, that's always, you know, uh, front and center of the discussion, like how you can exit um, and how you can do it, sort of, in a way that is attractive for, well, investors, you know, for the angel investors, for the seed investors, here you say, and, and along the way. And as Sandra was pointing out, definitely the last 18 months, the, we've seen a, a very important sort of mar market correction in Latin America. Uh, because also, as you mentioned, you know, the year before, there was sort of an influx of capital, you know, that it was massive. It was a, it was a bubble, really, I believe. Um, it created a lot of opportunities, it provided funding, sort of uh, um, unrestricted funding to, to, to many portfolio companies, um, and, and it played a role, um, but I think, you know, the last 18 months sort of had provided a, 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 a very important correction, sort of to Sandra's points, in terms of also highlighting, you know, uh, the importance of thinking about unit economics, the, the importance about, you know, considering growing, but in a healthy way. Um, and for the companies that have that mindset, that have been able to adjust, that have been able sort of to continue uh, scaling even despite the crisis, then exit opportunities to your question are available. Um, there, there are two, I think, two strategies that we see in Colombia and in the region in general that uh, I believe sort of are attractive, attractive from our liquidity perspective. Um, um, and especially for impact, and I will tell you why in, in just a minute. So the, the first one um, is um, M&A transaction. Um, in Latin America, I think, you know, the traditional, we, we're here in, in, in the Bay Area, right? So like Silicon Valley mindset in terms of, oh, I do early stage investing and uh, I hold to, uh, until IPO. I think that like Latin America, that, that is a very, very challenging uh, sort of um, uh, perspective. Uh, because it's not there yet, you know, maybe at some point in time, but it's not there yet. But that, that, that doesn't mean that that's the only way sort of to get to liquidity. In Latin America, you have a very well established sort of private sector, private market, like very big corporates, uh, you know, providing goods and services, uh, you know, uh, across uh, different sectors. Um, but also is the region with the biggest inequality, which means many of these corporates, they don't reach underserved segments of the population. That's where I think most of us came in, uh, come in, you know, in terms of providing funding to companies that are specifically addressing, addressing market gaps. 
And when you're able sort of to find those companies, invest in them, there are, you know, companies growing healthily to Sandra's point, you know, they, they are tapping sort of a, a vast market. Um, those are companies that very quickly, they become very attractive for corporates because they're showing them there is a way, there is a profitable way to get into a market in which they had not been able to, 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 um, uh, to tap before. So that, that's an avenue uh, that clearly um, is providing um, uh, liquidity to, to, to Latin American startups. And I think you know, it's, it's an avenue that in the impact ecosystem uh, it's, um, it's, it's where, where, where you have uh, greater opportunities. Um, and the other one I would say is also secondary market. Um, it's something that is taking a bit longer sort of to be developed, but we're starting to see the secondary market. Um, that's something that actually also in 2021, uh, that there were a very attractive opportunities sort of to exit to those investors, you know, those international investors that for the first time probably in, in years sort of they look at Latin America with, uh, as, a, as an investment opportunity and then provide liquidity to those earlier investors uh, that had already participated in, in, in you know, earlier uh, rounds of uh, financing. Um, and right now where some of this capital has pulled out, um, it means, pull out, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's just, it's, it's just waiting, you know, to, to deploy capital again um, for, you know, the local investors that we continue supporting the companies, those healthy companies that Sandra was pointing out, you know, those companies will require capital, but will have healthier in economics again, um, you know, will be able sort of to show growth, will be able to show that they're addressing important markets, and therefore these investors will, you know, step into the region again and, and provide the liquidity. Um, and so, you know, there are two different avenues. It's not a traditional sort of VC model uh, Silicon Valley, uh, but, but uh, I, I for sure think it's, uh, it's, it's where, we, where we need sort of to, to seek for liquidity. I know, Luis, too, you've been thinking quite a bit about secondaries and have a number of examples. So I would love for you to share how you've been thinking about secondaries as a tool to generate liquidity in addition to examples from the Salkantai portfolio. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and to Santiago's point, right? I mean, we're seeing a lot of activity right now after, you know, we're talking about 2021. There's a big correction. Um, I think in Q3 of this year, we're seeing a lot of activity, but more concentrated in less companies that have demonstrated they can be leaders and they're starting to consolidate. So we are investors in a company called Galgo, used to be called Migrante, just made one acquisition uh, of a uh, financial services company in Colombia. We're investors in a company in Mexico called Minu that acquired another company called Plurk. So there's a lot of acquisitions starting to happen. Uh, so we're gonna see a lot of consolidation, which I think is gonna drive a lot of liquidity to earlier investors. And on secondaries, uh, one thing that's happening is a lot of these companies, um, that we're investors on and we're looking to, in, to invest, they have investors that have been in their cap table for a long time and are looking for uh, liquidity. And when rounds are getting formed, a lot of times there's discussion of like, hey, is there an opportunity for secondaries? And that serves two purposes. One, it, I mean, it provides liquidity and returns to those earlier investors beyond paper returns, actual um, you know, DPI, not just TVPI, uh, so distributions. And then it's an opportunity for the new investors to increase their stake in those companies. If you think they're gonna be winners, you wanna have a, a larger percentage of that company. So, um, you know, and there's two deals going on right now where we are buying, uh, or negotiating, buying earlier investors so they can return capital. They can then, you know, go and raise the next fund, which I think is very, it's a healthy way to recycle capital in the ecosystem. And then they are, you know, we're obviously then increasing our stake and um, at a blended price. So usually secondaries have a discount, uh, there's a liquidity premium. So uh, it gives an opportunity also to enter a, at a more attractive valuation. What are you seeing in terms of timeline between initial investment and exit? I mean, it's venture is a illiquid asset. So it's not, I don't think it's, reasonable to expect, hey, I'm going to exit this deal in three years. A lot of people, I think in 2021, got excited because, you know, everything was growing. Um, you know, people were coming in and they were saying they're like, people are buying secondaries of like uh, high growth companies like Rappi because they want to have bigger stakes. So I think a reasonable holding period for any investor in ventures like five to 10 years. Um, 
and then and then you can provide returns. That's usually what your investors and your fund expect. Expect you don't expect to have you know recycled capital so fast that you're giving up returns. Um, so we're thinking investors that have been around a company. We're, we're investing in a company that's been around since like 2018. Uh, one of the investors uh, is already you know raising their second fund. So we want to you know we we like the company. We like the valuation, and uh, we're participating in that deal. So I, I just wanted to comment on the secondary uh, discussion because, you know, just a concrete example came up, uh, or um, I reminded myself, um, in how, how there, this is, is this actually also a, a mind shift sort of that is happening in the region. Um, for, for those um, uh, that, that don't know, sort of I'm in a live ventures, and we're, ra we're raising uh, our second fund, and we already had a first close. In our first fund, most of the capital that we raised was from DFIs. You know, development finance institutions, and uh, you know, part of the discourse for them is, you know, it's catalytic capital. Is we're you know investing uh, sort of to attract more capital sort of into the into the region and so on and so forth. And funny enough, one of the restrictions in our LPA is you cannot do secondary transactions because that's not catalytic capital. I mean, you're just buying out out another investor. How that? classifies as catalytic. This is 2018. I mean, this is not, you know, like 15, 20 years ago. Um, if, you think, if you think of that, you know, from an ecosystem market perspective, that's insane. Mm -hmm. I mean, how you can have sort of that restriction into the, an ecosystem, like how you cannot, you know, even provide liquidity to, the, to earlier stage investors. We're not, we're not seed investors. I mean, we're, not, we're slightly in the early growth stage of investors. But then the exciting news is in this second wave of, uh, of our second fund, that's no longer in our LPA, you know? And we, have, we are having sort of the similar LPs, uh, but there is, uh, I think, just another, uh, a more sophisticated discussion, and there's been sort of, uh, you know, uh, an evolution in the market um, to say, well, secondary transactions actually now is, is a liquidity option. Uh, it has to be for me, so let's provide also to the earlier investors, you know, that, that came before us. So, uh, just. Um, sharing an anecdote. Uh, and I would like to add something also in terms of alternative exits. Uh, well, another trend that we're seeing more every day is uh, corporate ventures coming into the play. Uh, in, in, with interest in buying exactly those, those players that have you pay, penetrate the market and consolidate their position, and and then these corporates, you know, want to uh, to have that a bit of that, and and then maybe uh, buy buy the whole the whole company. So we have very interesting examples of uh, you know global pharma companies that are putting together funds for the region because they are now seeking specifically this this type of companies. Um, in our case, we we work along a lot with Bimbo Bimbo Ventures. Uh, Bimbo is one of our anchor investors at, at LATAM Impact, a fund that Zone and Capital put together with Fondo Fondos for the region. And, and Bimbo Ventures is also very active in the ecosystem with all that relates to the you know, food production, ingredients, um, et cetera. So uh, I think that that is also an, an another new trend for the region, and it's very, very interesting. It's opening up a lot of, of opportunities for exits for these type of companies that are doing things that are relevant for the business models of these corporates. So let me tell you an example of our, our portfolio construction, how we are thinking about. So we invest in pre-seed and, and, and seed. Up to Series A, we can do investment, and we are in, in ending the year two of, of our fund. And we estimate that of our exits opportunities are going to be around 60% secondary and 40% and merchant acquisition. And of the merchant acquisition, we have like two options. In our case, that we invest in companies that are in emerging ecosystems in Latam, the five countries that I already told you. It's, um, we think, like for example, a Mexican or a Brazilian company that want to uh, increase their participation or escalate in, in Latam and will be interested in buying these kind of uh, companies that are maybe in Ecuador, Bolivia, and Paraguay. There are three markets on, on ones. And, and the other are the ones that, that Santiago mentioned that are big corporations, very, very traditional, especially in the countries that we work, that they are seeing that um, they are now, because the startup ecosystem is growing a lot, they see the technology and they are very afraid of this startup growing a lot. So that's another thing that we are. And we have a lot of LPs, or, of, or individual LPs, 
60% of them are first time VC investors and are the owners of these tr very, very traditional companies that want to put, uh, want to test the water first and to understand best, better the, how this startup ecosystem is growing. And I know you're also working very closely with each of your portfolio companies to help prime them for eventual exit. What are some of the ways that you're supporting them along that journey to get there? Yeah, especially, especially or, or, or support come when they want to grow in, in those countries. Uh, we, we count on LP base. Uh, they are very active in uh, activating and helping and doing the networking to connect in a, a Bolivian company that is going, for example, to, to, to Paraguay, or for example, a company in, in Ecuador now that is moving to Mexico, or LP base are, are really hands-on helping them, and that's, and they, they invest in, I think, because, because they want to learn how this works. And maybe in, in the next future, and they want to have their, their open innovation arm, and, and then a, a CVC all, all together, so that's the idea. For, for all of you, really, in the earliest stages of your diligence process, how are you assessing risk of the deals in your pipeline? And, and you know, at very early stage, trying to figure out whether this company might be primed for M&A, whether it might be primed for secondary. Luis, let's start with you. Um, yeah, and the first thing on, I mean, be, beyond, you know, the normal due diligence, like the team, the market, et cetera, first thing we look at is the corporate structure because it's really, um, and, and corporate structure a lot on the governance issues, because it's a really, I mean, doing m and is really hard. I, I acquired a number of companies and in previous companies that I used to run, and especially in Latin America, it's a, you open a company's like financial or, or governance documents, and it's, it's a, for the most part, it's a mess. There's like, you know, commingled stuff, personal, we acquired a company, not none of our fund, but like had like the the owner of the company's car was in the company, so they could be you know for tax reasons, and they were paying like school tuition from there, so total mess. So the first thing is you need to have a clean, you know, governance, cl clean cap table, um, clean you know like your financials need to be in order and everything like that. Then earlier stages, obviously, you don't have it. So you, what we do is we help a lot of the companies structure. Where do you need to incorporate? It's, you know, you have a local company, and then you have a holding company, and sometimes a blocker for, for acquisitions. So you need to start working with them on, you know, over the long term, what your governance is going to be. Who's going to be your, your legal team? Uh, how are you going to start? I mean, you don't need to audit, but you need to start working in accounting and having clean, clean books. So a lot of it is just like at the beginning. It's easier to start right than to fix. So a lot of it is just start right, get good advice. There's a lot of bad advice out there. Um, you know, people thinking, oh, I'm gonna incorporate in like Uruguay with a Spanish thing and like, okay, that's, that's great for certain kind of companies. It's not really good for like venture back companies. How about you, Sandra? How are you assessing uh, risk? Well, there's many aspects that of course we have we have to take, I mean, a deep, a deep look at. But I, I, one that I would maybe want to to talk about this here is the is the we we check the cap table and we see how aligned are the co-investors that we are that we are investing with, and this is important because uh, sometimes a bad a bad LP can create a lot of damage to the company and to the entrepreneur. So we really want to see that there's an alignment between the investors and the, and the founders, but also that there's an alignment among the investors. And we've had very interesting cases in which uh, there is, for instance, a corporate venture in the cap table and then VCs in the cap table and then there's a clear conflict there. Know, where, where, where they want to take the company to. So that is, that is some, something that not only from the investor's point of view, but also from the entrepreneur point of view, I think it's worth uh, looking at, especially in, since, the early, since the early rounds of equity, because founders sometimes um, think that the most important thing is to get the thing going, and then if the capital is coming from here, whatever, yes, let's receive the check. But this may cause problems along the life and the subsequent rounds and the subsequent needs of financing from the company. So that is something that I would recommend. Let me tell you two examples that we have seen, especially one entrepreneur from Paraguay and the other from, from Peru. 
you do all the checks of the entrepreneur in terms of revenue, the team was great. I mean, it was great to, to, to invest. However, when we see the cap table, it's usually you see like angels with 20% of the equity already done. So we do some, we help a lot the entrepreneurs also to go and talk with these angels and to understand because they say, I didn't know that at the beginning when I was creating this product, I didn't know that I can be busy, busy bake or, or I can take money from VC and grow to all over Latin America. But now after two years, I understand this. So to give them the skills and see how they negotiate this 20% with, with the angels and see and how this works. And we have, in, in terms of, we have seen like more than five examples of this and three of them, they solve the problem. They solve the problem with the angels. They understand how this VC world work, and we are working with one of them to to keep going and to in, in the investment community to see if we we finally invest. So, investing in emerging ecosystem is that you have to take into account all these kind of things, and it's not that the the startup will come and have all the checks. Maybe it's a lot of work with entrepreneur and understanding how the the VC world um, work. Thank you for that. One of the things that we were talking about as well was how often non-LATAM-based investors will come in, whether it's to a fund or directly into a company, later in, in Series B, you know, after you've done the work, Luis, to, to fix it from the get-go, uh, or start right, rather than fix it down the line, as you were saying. How do you think we can attract more capital, impact capital, venture capital, catalytic capital to LATAM earlier? Santiago, I see some I see some raised eyebrows, so I would love to start with you. Uh, I mean, so I, I think that's the million dollar question. I mean, that, I think that's that's uh, sort of the, the question that many of us sort of are, we're trying sort of to address in terms for unlocking the Latin American potential. Because I I think and I shared this in in another uh, uh, discussion and panel earlier in, in the week. You know, six eight years back, sort of the first discussion that we that uh, we had with investors in Latin America was: Is there pipeline? Is there? I mean, are you really going to be able to find companies that are investable? So on and blah blah blah. And you know, we're now that past that discussion. The ecosystem has grown dramatically. Um, the entrepreneurs, uh, and actually something that I find find really uh, interesting in the region is that in Latin America, entrepreneurs are now. They, they're born with, a, with an impact mindset. Uh, in the past, it was like, oh, I don't know if I'm, I mean, right now, that, that you're seeing it, you know, from universities. It's, it's, it's really exciting sort of what, what is happening from an ecosystem perspective. Um, so I don't think, like, probably that was the bottleneck then. Right now, the bottleneck is how we unlock capital to be able to fund, the, you know, that uh, entrepreneurs sort of that are going and, and scaling. And, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, that, that we have is something that you are trying to, you know, to address, but is how we get fund of fund structures. Uh, because look, we operate in Latin America, uh, uh, sorry, in Colombia mostly. In Colombia, there are four patient funds. Four, that's it. Uh, that means they're relatively big, right? And so they have to deploy a billion dollars a year uh, in alternative uh, assets. They, they have a team of, I don't know, two or three staff. They cannot do checks of less than 50 million. You know, they cannot do more than 20 deals in a year. Um, alive, I mean, we're hoping we will get sort of to the 80 million range. We will, you know, just by mathematics, we won't be able sort of to get a ticket from a Colombian uh, pension fund. And so, we need, I mean, we need to unlock different layers or different ways sort of to channel capital sort of to, to, to the local investors that I think that are also the ones that we are better positioned to, you know, find those successful investors and those that are sort of being more innovative and addressing sort of the, the, the market gaps. Um, and and, and how, how, we, how we create those structures and how we also, you know, change the risk perspective that, that this, you know, more tra traditional mainstream investors have uh, on the region is, is, is the sort of the biggest challenge right now. Sandra, how are you expecting exit opportunities to grow and change over the next several years? Well, I think that there's going to be every, uh, more corporate, more M&A. I'm, I'm not putting my hopes so high in the IPOs yet. <laughs> 
Uh, but but I think that with those with and the secondary of, of market of course uh, we'll get there. I mean we will we'll find our way to to grow our ecosystem and and continue help supporting the the maturity of it. Uh, another important sign is that we have seen much more uh, you know international investors coming to the region looking at it with the with a long term view, not with the short term view because. The, the 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 question that most investors raise always is what with what with all the socioeconomical no political problems that are happening in the region in the specific countries, but this been this has been always the situation in our in our region, and I think that when when these investors long term investors come to the region, they see it in a very different way that we that are living the problems inside the country see it, and they see it in a long term vision, and they say. Well, we we just we will discount it. You know, we have already, you know, taken that into account. In, in there's always these cycles, and they they have a more optimistic view sometimes than, than the national investors or the or the local investors. So when you were saying about the capitals going out, yeah, that's mostly the case for local investors. But at the same time, you see the reverse effect of international coming to to the region. So that is something that I'm also putting my hopes high there. And also, as, as, as Ante was saying, trying to unlock you know, pension funds, insurance companies, other big, big uh, asset allocators uh, money into, into the space. I agree with Sandra, the 2% of all of the LATAM companies, if you see all the exits, only 2% were IPO. And that is in the last 10 years. And that is going to continue, maybe 3% or 4%, but it, that is going to remain there. So I agree with, with that. And, and talking about our, our companies again, sometimes we see that a company to reach Series A, uh, they have to knock the doors of Mexicans BC. That's always because they want to reach to Mexico uh, as, as the biggest um, uh, market in, in Spanish-speaking Latin. And we always talk with entrepreneurs, sometimes it's the case to go to Mexico, but sometimes it's not the case. And I was talking with a, with a company called Prestamipe that is in, in Salcantay portfolio and, and the and, and alive too and alive too <laughs> and I love what the founder was telling me Laure was telling me I, I uh, how was the run and and she told me and I lost a lot we lost a lot of time talking to Mexico VCs because uh, because we wanted to reach we wanted to have Mexicans VC in our in our cap table and we didn't understand that our focus it have to be Peru, because the market is too big in Peru for them, and it's, it's, they have to, they still have room to to increase and to escalate in Peru. So, I was thinking about that the connection in the in the ecosystem here in in, in the U.S. and in 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 Latam is not both ecosystems are not well connected. So there is a huge opportunities to VC based in in the U.S. to to be part of these of these deals. And, and, and also work together with, with VCs like, like us. Mm -hmm. and, and if I may, the one thing um, to follow up on Hasmin's point, one thing we're looking is uh, a lot of companies in you know, the 2021s when capital you know, was free, there was like, you know, yields were like really low, there was, it was grow at, at all costs. And it was, you know, so they raised a lot of money and it was all used for expansion, growing, opening new offices, hiring both lots of people, and now that capital is, um, I mean, there's, there's about, a, about a, I think this year, my calculation, we're gonna end, you know, investment at about a five billion, which is one third from the peak, but it's actually double what it was like in the, in the previous decade. So there's a lot more capital now, discounting the, you know, the, the big bubble, and that capital is being deployed, I think, much more thoughtfully, much more focused on, you know, unit economics, much more focus on how, when I'm going to get the most out of this. And a lot of it is like, to Hasmi's point, like, you know, more thoughtful growth. Is Mexico the real opportunity? Or, you know, should I just like focus more on my market? And Prestamipe's point, it's uh, fintech for micro entrepreneurs. Uh, Peru is like the, Peru, Bolivia are like the two largest microfinance markets in the world, the most yeah. successful. So there's a huge opportunity there. Uh, but other companies that we've invested in, like Ubits, went to Mexico, grew like crazy there. They're doing, they're doing really well. Um, they're like, you know, killing it, and now they're looking to actually be a, an acquirer of other companies. So 
a lot of things are happening is just like, where do you focus your growth and you know, where do you get the most out of it? Yeah, and I think that one of the signals of a, of a market that is maturing is when you see the entrepreneurs taking the decisions based on the business sense and not on where's the capital, right? Or what do I have to do to align to the investor that has a, the big ticket? But really going into what is strategically the things that really matter for my company growth to enable the growth and do that, no? And then look for the investors that are really aligned to that vision. And I think that is something that just happened in mature markets where you see more investors coming, more specialized funds, understanding really the dynamics and the industries, which are very different, you know, among all the alternatives that we have in, 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 in the impact space, just talking about the impact space, no? We have education, we have health, we have um, clean energies, and each of these are very different in terms of dynamics, industries, market potential, everything. So specialized funds also have a very key role in, you know, because they, they understand better really what the companies need and they, they provide much more value added in, in the process. Wonderful. We only have a, excuse me, a couple minutes left, but I would love to hear from you all about what members of our audience, who presumably are a mix of allocators, founders, impact enthusiasts, can do to help connect some of the dots, has mean that you were talking about. Santiago, let's start with you. You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think it, it really depends sort of uh, where you're coming from, right? Um, if, if, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, I think Sandra just gave sort of the best advice uh, uh, to them is really look for the right source of funding for your company. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes an entrepreneur can make is try to align its business model to the funding. Um, and so, and that's something that actually, because of the relatively, you know, early stage of the Latam ecosystem happens quite often. Uh, I, I, you know, we invest in the Indian region and you know, many times, you know, there is the entrepreneur saying, well, I, I could expand to Colombia in, uh, and therefore make it, you know, that is, uh, that is um, uh, an investment um, available for you. It's like, no, don't go to Colombia just because, you know, you want to receive my capital. Like, go if it's, a, you know, uh, if it makes sense, a business sense. Um, so I guess that, that's one. Uh, for, for the, and then I'm going sort of to the, the other side of the table. If you are, if you are an asset owner, um, I, I truly you know, invite asset owners sort of to, to look at Latin America as an ecosystem that has drastically evolved, uh, an ecosystem that is really poised for growth and opportunity, um, especially when we are in an impact sort of discussion, uh, because this, this is, you know, impact discussion is about sort of access, it's about getting sort of to untapped markets, and technology is playing an incredible role in enabling businesses to be able to reach th those segments of the population that previously were, you know, it was, it was impossible because of the economics, because of the cost of reaching to them. So um, Latin America, unfortunately, is the region sort of with the biggest inequality, but then is where also you get incredible opportunities uh, nowadays, sort of to be able to, to, to solve for that need. And here are a few fund managers that can help you sort of to <laughs> unlock that capital. As a closing question to all, would love to hear, starting with you, Hasmin, about what you're most excited about in the region over the next couple of years. Yeah. I'm very excited about entrepreneurs coming from the countries that we focus. I, I, we really believe that talent is everywhere. But I have seen in my previous work uh, as a vice minister of economy that all the entrepreneurs that we were working and giving the grants, and they come again to get, to, the, to get the same grants all over the year, all over the year, because they didn't have opportunities. They didn't have the smart money and people to think and act with them to escalate their, their business to other countries. And, and, and also, I had a lot of uh, talks with other VCs, why do you don't invest in these Bolivian entrepreneurs or these entrepreneur from Ecuador? And they say, I really want to invest, but I don't know how to do it. I don't, I don't know how to do the due diligence. I don't understand the numbers when these uh, uh, entrepreneur tell me. So I really believe on the growth uh, and the exits of the startups coming from frontier ecosystems in LATAM. And it's very important to be first in the seats 
And as you already see, we talk about the numbers in Chile and Colombia, and then who are going to be the next ecosystems in LATAM. And, and in five years, we, we will talk, I'm sure that we will talk about the growth in Peru, the growth in Ecuador, Bolivia, and, and also Paraguay. I'm excited about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, it's, I mean, after a, you know, a, a bubble and then the bursting of the bubble, one thing people sometimes fail to appreciate, those bubbles actually create a lot of value. And in this case, a lot of value is in terms of like, people learn more about what venture is, what entrepreneurship is. You're seeing a lot more students that I, you know, back in the day, we were thinking about consulting or investment banking. Now they're thinking about entrepreneurship. They're looking at impact opportunities because to Santiago's point, it's like, our, our motto is the gap is the opportunity. And unfortunately, Latin America is full of gaps. Those gaps are not gonna get fixed by government. They're not gonna get fixed by corporates. It's the huge opportunity for entrepreneurs leveraging technology to bridge those gaps in education, in financing, in, in sustainability, in health, et cetera. So I'm really excited about this maturity of the ecosystem, a lot more talent going to try to solve those, uh, solve those gaps. Uh, and then venture. One thing that happened, I mean, I'm older than I look, I remember in 99, 2000, when the crash happened, uh, there was a lot of venture in Latin America, people forget about it. But after the crash happened, there was none, because it was mostly US funds that were doing all the investment, and when you know, the bubble crashed, they were all gone. Now, with, even after the, the bursting of the bubble, there's funds that are committed to the region, you know, Dalus, all VP in Mexico, Alive, Salcantay, I think, we're not gonna go to Texas and do you know, oil exploration like Hicksmuse did, right, when they uh, put the bubble burst. They're gonna be committed to the regions and they're the ones that are still funding companies at the earlier stages, helping entrepreneurs um, you know, structure their investment, think of a long-term strategy, and then accompanying those, comp accompanying those companies through their you know, multiple rounds all the way to their exit. Or oh, if I want, if you want, I can go. Uh, something that excites me is the it's the awakening that we are having, you know, as a as as a population in general. I'm not talking just Latam, but I live in well, I, I I work and and I love Latam, so that that's where I, I I can comment on. But I'm sure this is global. There's an awakening about how how much we need to work in terms of sustainability and social problems, how much we need to really innovate and use technology to, to come up with the solutions for the many gaps that Luis was referring to. And, but, but something that makes me very, very you know, happy and excites me every day is to see how many people out there, entrepreneurs, fund managers, uh, everyone, it's looking now more and more at these problems and, and thinking in creative ways to come up with solutions from different seats, perspectives, you know, development institutions, fund of funds as we are, as we are or fund, direct funds or, or, you know, companies, people, entrepreneurs, students, everyone is it's more conscious today of, of the urgency of what we need to do in order to, to you know, drive us as humanity. So that really, really excites me and inspires me every day. I would love to give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much for joining. I may have a little bit of bias. Two of the four of these are in our portfolio at Sorensen Impact Foundation. It's possible a third might join, but I, I truly think these are the best of the best and would love to invite audience questions if you have any for our panelists for the remainder of our time together. Um, how, if at all, are you thinking uh, around the notion of sus sustainability of impact beyond exit? It's a little bit of kind of an advanced uh, practice, but you know, in the impact investing world, thinking about finding aligned partners you know, uh, in exits that are going to kind of support the, the ongoing mission of the business. Um, it's not going to always you know, dictate or be a you know, 
decision making um, factor and exit. To ha you know, you have to do what makes sense for the business. Uh, and ideally, a partner that's going to support the business is going to support the impact of the business. But there are different kinds of, you know, maybe corporates, other uh, exit opportunities that might influence, you know, how much that impact is locked into the next phase of, an, of a company's growth. So I'm curious if that's playing into your thinking at all as you talk about exits. Yeah, and actually, w we just went through a, uh, a, a really great discussion with one of our LPs. We were in a, in a strategy session together, and a lot of it is the way to ensure that that impact continues is to have the company be extremely successful, and whoever you know buys that company buys it because they're having so much success at that impact that they're not just buying it to, you know, to get the talent. You know, a lot of acquisitions are like talent acquisitions. No, you, we want, um, you know, the financial institution that will acquire it one day Prestamipe because, oh my God, the micro entrepreneur space is so good and they're doing so great at it that, you know, we want to continue to support this. So um, I think a lot of people sometimes get, I mean, impact, if you want to use like a two by two matrix, it's like how big it is, the opportunity, but also how well you're doing in it. So a lot of impact investors over, I think, many years were so focused on how depth, the depth of the impact um, and not on, you know, you're not going to have impact if you're only, you know, serving like one percent of the market. You need to to grow it, and then, you know, whoever acquires is going to, you know, want to continue doing that because it's the opportunity is there. Uh, I would complement also that I think one of the first things that we do in due diligence uh, is really sort of understanding how the business model is aligned with the impact, it, and it's not something tangential, right? Like but it's actually embedded in the DNA of the company and the business model. And therefore, you know, that, that goes sort of to Luis's point. Like if a successful company is acquired because there is a, you know, they're in a market that is growing and they're scaling and, and that's the business model, it's very difficult to envision, you know, that someone will acquire, unless, unless because it's the competition and they want, you know, to kill it, <laughs> which would be sad, but I guess that's also, you know, something you need to look at, you know, when, when you're exiting. Uh, but if it's embedded in the business model, the impact, then it's something that it goes hand by hand. Any other questions from folks? Thanks for uh, sharing insights, valuable insights. Uh, the question is, do you prioritize or include metrics on social impact returns uh, combined with economics because we want to grow both together. There is a prioritization on that. How you kind of weight that in the overall return? Yeah. Okay. Yes, and uh, thanks for the question. Of course, it is very important. And actually, we I'm, I'm, I'm talking from, from, from LATAM impact perspective, so in capital. Um, for us, we only do impact, right? But when you say what you do impact, what do you mean, right? You need indicators. You need, you need data that shows, as, as in financial returns, you need that data that supports that you're actually doing impact, no? In terms of access, in terms of whatever you're doing, the type of impact that you're, you're at. So we have developed uh, internally a methodology to, to track this impact through, through indicators, specific indicators per industry, because these, of course, are different for, from industry to industry. We, as, as we commit the money, we ask for a legal compromise from the companies or funds to, to report these impact indicators. And we, we are not saying that we want to have like a whole set of indicators that are going to complicate the life of, but, but as Santiago was saying, uh, these are in the DNA of the companies. So basically you are talking about unit economics and operation uh, performance uh, indicators, you know, because if you're talking, for instance, about a health company, patients reach is, 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 is an operational uh, indicator, but it's also an impact indicator, right? So in that sense, uh, we, we get that, we get the compromise, the legal binding compromise of them in, uh, reporting those, and we also report that to our own LPs. So it is a, as key as getting the, the, the other financial data. Uh, I, just to that yeah. comment, I think it's also, we need to, ch all of us, you know, to change our mindset in terms of what we think, when we think about impact and impact indicators is, we, we, you know, in the past, as you know, it's like someone force is, is like top-down approach of saying you need to report number of users and like not valuable data. 
and 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 because that's just a burden, you know, across the value chain and for uh, until the entrepreneur that needs to collect. If you're in a company that your business model, the impact is embedded in the business company, the impact measurement must be related, same as measuring financial performance, operational performances. I mean, if like it's understanding your customer, how perceives your, your business or your product or your service. It's understanding sort of, I don't know, if you're an education company uh, that are tr you're trying to provide a, 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 a training to improve access to uh, paying jobs, you know, formal jobs. It's like measure that to see if actually what you're offering is, 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 a, is you know, helping to achieve that goal or not. So is, and we, we use a third party that is specialized in, 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 in that, it's called 60 decibels. Um, initially, when, when all our portfolio companies go through uh, impact measurements with them, initially, you know, we have to pay for it uh, because the company is just like, they have this mentality, it's like impact reporting is a burden on me, it's, it's not valuable, it's just a burden. We've had, you know, after they go through the process, they see the data, the data, the quality of the data, now saying, you know what, I'll pay for it next time. Because it's, it's just providing valuable information to the entrepreneur, to us as fund managers, and then sort of to the LPs, the asset owners, of, you know, what, what's happening, and to be able sort of to take informed decisions in terms of product, in terms, and then, of course, that translates into the impact as well. So it creates a, vir a virtual circle rather than, the traditional mentality of this is a burden, which is, I think, the, the one that comes from, you know, the traditional DFI world and like, you know, an impact study is a three-year study. No, 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 there, I mean, technology has also enabled us to do it much more faster and much more efficiently. Uh, and so as a VC company, first we have to understand how, we have to understand at least the, the logic, how this company will return at least 10 times or 15 times what we are putting in, in, in the company. So that's first. And the second thing that we always look before that investment go to a, a company goes to investment committee is how this company is, is solving a structural pro problem in LATAM within a sector that we focus. And for that, we also have developed a, an internal like matrix uh, where we put the potentials, indicators, and social and climate education uh, indicators that we are going to use if we invest in this company. And sometimes, it, this exercise is very good because sometimes we understand the financial return and then we thought that this company may have a lot of impact. But after putting all the numbers in the matrix, we understood that that was not the case. And, and another thing that is super interesting as we invest early stage, pre-seed, seed, and of course the, the companies, uh, they don't have all the indicators. They know that they are making the impact more or less and they are going. So in the first three months, we sit with them and we uh, build with them the indicators that they will measure. And so it's something very easy. It's not very difficult. And after that, that open a lot of doors for, for them in terms of companies that they are selling their products or in terms of other potential VCs that are coming because now they have the indicator. So it's a super important key that we work with them and they are open only because they have all the indicators in order. And I'm sorry, I don't want to hijack the conversation, but it's, I'm just passionate about, it, about this specific point because I think also as a sector, we are at crossroads in terms that, I mean, many people outside of this room also are starting to talk about impact. Uh, but then there is also the risk, you know, of the social wash, the green wash, and then in five years time, it's like, eh, this was another CSR, or this was, you know, something else that didn't work out. So we need to measure, uh, because if we don't measure, uh, we won't be able sort of to show that we're delivering on what we have set out to do. We have time for one or two more questions, if anyone has any. Yeah, I wanted to go into one of the initial points of returns of investment and exit strategies in LATAM. Uh, so how do you see from your experience like going public in Latin America versus going public in the US? If we look into some examples like Nubank that went public in Brazil and in, in NASDAQ, I believe. So maybe, you know, possibilities for, for impact-driven companies, like have you seen any success stories that you could share? Or if there's a chance for like ADRs 
between you know latam and us like how do you see that potential for long term exit strategy for all of us i mean the companies the latin american companies that went public in the you know the last uh, few years nubank satellogic the local etc they all listed in in new york nasdaq or or nysc because of liquidity right it's you want to and, and you know you want to be in a market where uh, you're actively traded you can raise capital at the end that's why you go public because you're raising capital through the ipos um, unfortunately I, mean, i don't know all the bolsas or, or exchanges uh, in latin america they tend to be tend to be very concentrated on either financial services or mining so it's very difficult for um, companies to go public there i know the mexican stock exchange i forgot her um, she's been pushing a lot of like the viva viva uh, the stock exchange and trying to push it but at the end of the day you know i think you're going to have if you go public which i think we we're talking earlier less than half of half a percent of companies will eventually go public not just latin america also in silicon valley um, it's more how do you can i prepare yourself for an acquisition more so than just going public i think once you get to the going public you need to measure you know it'll probably be new york stock exchange or nasdaq or venture back company of the brazilian ipo i think that is 50-50 i was reading the other day an article that was that was 50-50 and another example that that i was thinking about is like we are now uh, in uh, having conversation with a entrepreneur from ecuador and he had an ipo is a marketplace of uh, vehicles vehicles and they did a an ipo in australia That was, that was, and it was a really good exit. That was like eight years ago. So it have to be, we have to open our mind about that. So that was a good question. They had another company exited in Australia, Life360, which was an investor in a previous fund. They also did an IPO in Australia, and I'm still kind of baffled why. Ah. But it was like, you know, that's where they were able to raise capital.